Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about halogenation and related additions to alkenes. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems I assigned last lecture. So in this first problem, I ask you to propose conditions that would give you the reduction on the cyclohexane as well as the reduction on the cyclopentene. Now, this is a Michael acceptor and the other alkene here, this is not um, this is not a Michael acceptor. This is just a typical alkene. So we're going to want to use different conditions for each of the alkenes. So on the left, we could do a diimide reduction because these tend to react with electron rich uh, alkenes more than electron poor alkenes. However, we could use something like Stryker's reagent to do a reduction on the, on the Michael acceptor portion. Now, if you did something like palladium on carbon with hydrogen for this, you'd probably just reduce both of them because palladium is pretty reactive, as I highlighted in the last episode. In the next problem, I ask you to propose conditions that would convert this alkyne to the alkene shown here. And so there's a couple different conditions we could use. We could use Lindler's catalyst, or we could do a P2 reduction in the presence of hydrogen because these catalysts stop once an alkene is formed. So this other alkene in our molecule won't be touched. Now in the final problem, I asked you to show the product of the following reaction. We have palladium on carbon, we have hydrogen gas, and it's at room temp for 48 hours. Now in this case, because we have two alkenes and we're using an excess of hydrogen in the presence of a palladium catalyst, both of them should be reduced to the saturated uh, fatty acid product. So with that, let's get to today's material, halogenation and related additions to alkenes. So a halonium can form in the presence of an electrophilic halogenating agent uh, when it reacts with an alkene. So this is typically seen for chlorine, bromine, and iodine. However, there's one case uh, where a fluoronium has been prepared by Thomas Lechtka's group at John Hopkins University. Now, it's quite controversial in the fluorine chemistry community, and it's really like a fluorine connected to two, a fluoride anion connected to two carbocations, and it's just kind of hot potatoing back and forth. But in the crystal structure, the fluorine is equidistant between both carbon centers, so it still technically could be considered a fluoronium. Now, in the normal case, if you form a halonium and you treat it with a nucleophile, it can open it up the same way that you'd open up an epoxide. And this will introduce a total of two new functional groups, the halogen, which is the, the X+, plus, as well as the nucleophile. So if you use like bromine or iodine, for instance, you can get a 1,2 dihalide. Now, you don't typically see this with iodine too much because the resulting diiodide is fairly unstable, um, but you see this quite often for bromine. And it's worth noting that this is formed in a trans relationship, and when we talk about the mechanism, you'll see why. If you do this reaction in the presence of water, you'll form what's called a halohydrin, and that's because water can act as the nucleophile opening up the uh, carbocation, or opening up the halonium. It's also worth noting that if you treat this halohydrin with a base, it's possible to form an epoxide. So in addition to the uh, MCPBA mediated epoxidation of alkenes, you could use this as a way to make epoxides as well. So some considerations for these reactions include, uh, you could also use alkynes. So here you can see an alkyne reacts with bromine to form this one, two um, uh, opposite uh, alkene. So this would be Entgegen. Now, if you want to see an example of this, there's a total synthesis paper where they do this on a substrate. There's also other variants. So you could use an alcohol. Here I've reduced the DOI using this tiny URL because it was quite a cumbersome long DOI that I hope nobody ever has to type out. So here, uh, essentially, instead of water reacting, you just have the alcohol attacking the halonium. So these don't work too well most of the time, but if you use a propargyl alcohol, they tend to work well. And if you're doing an intramolecular reaction for ring formation, these can work fairly well, as long as they follow Baldwin's rules, which is a topic we'll cover in a future video. It's also possible to do what's known as halolactonization, or haloesterification. Now, it's usually done for ring formation, hence lactone. A lactone is a cyclic ester. Um, these work really well with like iodolactonization reactions, and they're quite often seen in total synthesis, react, uh, total synthesis papers. One other uh, use that you don't see mentioned as frequently that I thought I'd highlight here is haloazidation, where you can add a halogenating agent as well as like an azide, and you'll add both of those to an alkene, and I believe this can also be done with alkynes. Here's one example of that. So when we're considering the halogenation of alkenes, there's various different reagents that we can use. Most of the time you'll see NBS, DBH, or bromine used. However, there are some weaker ones that, again, aren't quite frequently covered, but this electron withdrawing perfluoroalkyl group, perfluoro just means that every carbon has a fluorine on it, uh, is like fully fluorinated instead of hydrogens. That really pulls electron density away from the bromine, and this makes this a good Br plus source. Not, not that good compared to the other ones, 
but if you have a strong enough electrophile, it can be used. So something like a benzyne would easily react with these and form like a triple bond version of a bromonium. Okay, and another example would be perfluorobromobenzene, which is an even weaker one that you could use as well. So sometimes if you have too powerful of a brominating agent, you need to tune them down. So in this case, we have bromine as our electrophile. The alkene electron density can attack the bromine. The bromine can collapse back down and attack the carbocation. And so that's why we have what resembles an epoxide. And then the, the Br minus, which was kicked off of the Br2, can then come back in from the opposite face and attack and open it up, forming a 1,2 trans dihalo compound. Now, similar for the halohydrin reaction, bromine is polarized by the solvent. So in a nonpolar solvent, bromine can be a good radical Br source. But in a polar solvent, bromine will be a good uh, bromo like a Br plus source. Um, and then instead of Br minus opening it up, water can come and open it up from the opposite face. And so the regiochemistry of this reaction is the water will add where the more stable carbocation can be formed. So if this is a more substituted position, water will usually add to the more substituted position. Styrenes are a bit of an exception where you get mixtures, but in most cases, the water will attack at the more substituted position. So in the case of bromination of alkenes, here you can see that this sulfone containing cyclohexene was able to be converted to this trans dibromide. Additionally, another cyclohexene was treated with bromine in carbon tetrachloride, which is actually a nonpolar solvent, but they still got this reaction to work, uh, affording this 1,2 trans bromide. Now for halohydrin reactions, here you can see that water adds to the more substituted position, as I was saying. So the bromine is uh, from NBS. The reason that they would use NBS instead of bromine is just so that there isn't any Br- minus that could po possibly compete with the water. So if you use NBS, the only counter would be succinamide, and while succinamide is a good nucleophile, it's not a very stable, it doesn't form very stable adducts. And so this should be essentially a one-way reaction. And water is the only other competitive nucleophile. Under basic conditions, acetate might add and do a halo esterification, but because water is here and it's under acidic conditions, water is the nucleophile that reacts. And you can see it's a relatively fast reaction in one hour. Another case is we have this nitrile uh, with an alkene and the alkene just reacts, again, water goes to the more substituted position, and there's some stereochemical control over uh, where the water is added. So with that, I'd like to assign a few practice problems for this lecture. First, show conditions for how you'd get this 1,2 syn dibromide, and so this will require a few different steps using chemistry that we've talked about earlier in this course. Um, additionally, show using the chemistry that we just talked about how you'd form this 1,2 trans bromide. You don't need to synthesize a single enantiomer of this. It's fine to have a racemic mixture, but it's important to have, in this case, a 1,2 cis dibromide, and in this case, a 1,2 trans dibromide. Uh, additionally, predict the product of the following reaction. You have NBS and water. What product forms? Uh, and in the last example, we have this alkene here, and we treat it with Br2. Predict the product of this reaction. And so with that, I hope that this has been a useful video on the dihalogenation or the halo functionalization of alkenes. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And if you left a like or subscribed, I would really appreciate it. Have a great day.